Please be seated, friends. And good morning. It's just such a privilege each Sunday to gather with you and to be able to greet you and to see your faces and know that uh, we are the body of Christ together. And uh, so welcome comes from me, Reverend Philip Newman, one of the ministers on staff. And welcome from Reverend Simon Lussure, my colleague, another colleague, our minister of music, Gerald Van Wyck. And uh, our wonderful choir, now some of the choir members say, oh, don't talk about us as being wonderful and amazing, but they are. <laughs> and, <laughs> and now someone will ask, why did you have them clap for us today? <laughs> and uh, today is their, uh, the last Sunday that they're sharing in worship uh, for the summer break. And so we just wish you well have a creative, restful, uh, meaningful summer. We know we'll see you here in worship, and many of you will be participating uh, musically in some way. Just really glad you're here today. And uh, welcome to everyone that gathers here in this place, and it might be the first time that you're here in our sanctuary, and, and I really want those around you to help you to feel at home uh, today. Welcome to those joining us by live stream as well. It's a little tougher to reach out to you, but we're glad uh, that you're part of this wonderful assembly uh, today. And uh, today we acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of Coast Salish people and uh, the, uh, the families of the Squamish and the tsleil nations have been traditional custodians of this area. We are glad that they are and that we are gathered on this land today. Uh, if you have questions about the life and work of the church, uh, events that are coming up, the welcome table is a great place to stop by and ask those questions. That's a table that you find in our church hall. After worship, the church hall is a place that we gather together for refreshment, uh, in conversation, uh, to meet up with one, or, one another, and to meet someone new as well. And today, if you're looking for help with uh, those under four years of age, there is our nursery just on the lower level. Uh, the quickest way is through the doors and the stairway just in the back in the far corner behind our tech booth. And Sunday Club is available for those four and older, and you'll be having fun with both Simon and uh, Dylan today. Now, just by way of uh, announcements that I've been asked to point out to you this morning, uh, community lunch is coming up on Wednesday. Uh, we will be observing Canada Day in, in that gathering. The uh, music comes to us from the Silk Purse Singers, and, and uh, we are, are glad to, do, to have them there, and uh, strawberries will be in season somewhere this week, and we will get to enjoy that. What we do need to know is that you're planning to be there. You can let the church office know, and please uh, share the invitation. Uh, with those that you know who would benefit by a time together uh, with other folk. You will want to know that uh, uh, a brief history of our congregation has been put together, and now you can find it uh, on the website of the West Vancouver Historical Society. I've, I've seen it myself. Uh, in the bulletin, you'll see the website that you can go to just to take uh, a look at that. It's just a, a wonderful, easy, and brief romp through a hundred years. Uh, the 100th anniversary family camp, it, the plans continue for that. This year, because it's 100th anniversary, it's an all-church retreat, and you can sign up by visiting our own church's uh, website. Last weekend, we had fun with the picnic of the century. Uh, those who helped to organize uh, a lot are are being asked by Victoria Mendez to gather very briefly today after worship in the uh, church lounge, just for a, a time to debrief the event, how it, how it went, and uh, she promises that just to be uh, a few minutes in length. Coming up this week is the John Gauss Memorial Classic. Can folks still get in on that? Stop at the welcome table. This would be your last opportunity to indicate your participation today. It's on Thursday in Swamish. You'll see an insert in the bulletin. It's letting you know about the summer sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. This was a suggestion that came from a number of you uh, last summer when we were exploring uh, the Apostles' Creed. 
And some of you indicated uh, uh, that the Lord's Prayer is a deeply meaningful prayer for you. Others uh, confessed shyly that you really had no idea why we continue to use that week by week and uh, don't understand it. So it's an opportunity to explore what that prayer is about, how we have it, and you'll see a number of guests are going to help uh, just break that open a little bit for us throughout the summer. The next Sunday and the Sunday after that, Jerry is going to uh, lead us in a brief hymn sing. You'll see some information in the bulletin about that. We're going to do that for a Sunday or two. And what we are asking you to do is to think about a favorite hymn that you might like us as a congregation to sing. And we'll do that next Sunday and the Sunday after that. You don't need to tell us in advance what that uh, hymn or song is, but be thinking of that favorite and why it may be a favorite of yours. What's the background about it having become uh, a, a song, uh, a hymn that you like us to sing? We'll be singing from the Voices United uh, hymn book, so there are some parameters on what songs uh, we can sing. So be thinking about that. Lots of things going on, and be part of them as you're able. Good morning. Um, just a few, uh, a few prayer requests for all of you. Um, the first one is um, tonight is our last gathering for the marriage course. And a huge thank you to all of you who've been keeping us in prayer. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at love in action. And um, I know your prayers have made such a, a huge, huge difference for the, uh, for the different couples who've gathered for that. And um, the last piece that I want to mention is next week, um, starting July, July 2nd, um, is our summer kids camp. And so if you uh, have any uh, children or grandchildren or see any kids running around your neighborhood, uh, please do invite them. It's a really great time. And um, several years ago, a friend of mine, I was involved in a camp in Thunder Bay, and um, one of my colleagues was from India and had just recently arrived to the country, and he decided he would take on inviting kids from the neighborhood. And uh, we had to pull him aside and tell him to change his tactics when he realized he was driving around in a van <laughs> offering candy to children. <laughs> Luckily, he wasn't arrested. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so don't do that, but um, if you do know of kids uh, who could really benefit from um, Summer Kids Camp is a really great entry point into the wider church family. And so if you know of, of kids or of families who could really use the community that you've found here, um, please do reach out to them. And then uh, from there, we lovingly take them under our wing. So um, this morning, as we go deeper into worship, um, just as a thank you for the choir for their dedication for coming and rehearsing together every Wednesday and leading us in worship. Um, I asked them before the service started, I said, I would love if one of you, any one of you, would be willing to light the Christ candle this morning. And Tristan said, well, I will gladly play with more fire. <laughs> And so uh, Tristan will be lighting the Christ candle this morning on behalf of the choir um, as a reminder of uh, some of the work that they do, which is leading us in God's presence uh, through your incredible talent. If you haven't seen it yet, the video of uh, Tristan spinning poi with the choir singing behind him um, has now become our most viewed video on Facebook. <laughs> so you can see that. <laughs> You're like, you guys are famous now. <laughs> Please join with me in the call to worship. The Lord be with you. Come, let us worship the Lord our God, whose love quenches our thirst. Let us praise God who is always with us. We seek the one who will not desert us. Let
let us open our hearts to the God who calls us by name.
pray. Open our hearts today, O oh Lord, to feel the powerful strength and love you have for us. Help us to listen, not only with our ears, but with our spirits, for your words of compassion and healing. Life is sometimes like a giant spider web. We seem to get caught and entangled in its threads. We don't know which way to turn. We are unsure how to extricate ourselves from the dilemmas in which we are trapped. Forgive us when we turn and run for cover. Give us an extra measure of strength along with your forgiving love that we may again place our whole trust in you. This we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able to uh, proclaim with me the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Before we head off to Sunday Club, I'd love to invite the kids and teens who are here this morning um, up to the front so that we can pray with you. And we pray with you because we love you. And um, I know some of you were at a, a birthday party with a bouncy castle yesterday. You know when you're looking for a place in West Van and you can't quite find it and you turn the corner and there's a giant bouncy castle? <laughs> That's how you find birthday parties. All right, let me pray with all of you and then uh, we'll head off to Sunday Club. God, I thank you so much for, um, for these young people. God, we thank you that you love them so much. In the same way you love us. God, as a church, um, I pray, God, that you would continue to uh, help us find ways to be open to their voice, to their ideas, to their energy, and to their questions. As we head off for Sunday Club, God, may your spirit go before us, and young and old. May you teach us what it means to be plugged in. We ask and pray all of this in Jesus' awesome and holy name. Amen. All right, off we go. Let us pray. Almighty God, as human creatures placed in your earthly creation, we seek your presence in our lives as a guide on our pathway. We thank you for your gift of Jesus, who by his example shows us your way. We thank you for your Pentecostal gift of the Holy Spirit, who accompanies each one of us through trial and tribulation, through celebration and joy. Lord, today we ask your presence in the deliberations of our world's nations facing one another antagonistically. May your presence encourage negotiation and discussion to resolve difficult issues that must be faced rather than threats of weapons and war. We are mindful too, Lord, of the 70 million refugees in our world, created by this atmosphere of distrust of neighbor for neighbor, of wars between neighbor and neighbor, resulting in millions of people homeless, stateless, struggling for the basic necessities of life. Help us as a community to continue to try and do what we can against this overwhelming need. And we pray that in our nation, Canada, having celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day this week, we might bind all of our diverse communities together, accepting our differences, rejoicing in our similarities, and striving to work at understanding and respecting one another. May your peace, love, and justice prevail in our world. Lord, we ask that in this summer season of holiday and recreation, we take full advantage of our opportunities to rest, relax, recharge, and return to our tasks invigorated, eager to meet old and new challenges. Give us courage during this time to examine ourselves for our own shortcomings. Give us courage to modify their hold, liberating us to be all that you can see that we might be. Lord, of all things, we ask for your presence in the lives who need you most, those walking in the shadows. Support those who suffer, who are fearful, who despair, who mourn. Help them feel your love and support. In this congregation and community, we especially pray for Ben, Jennifer, Pierre, Aaron, 
Georgia, Pat, Michael, Sue, Nikki, Jill, Alistair, Terry, Phil, Christine, Terry. And we name others known to us in silence. We ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not long ago, I received uh, a note of appreciation to the congregation, and it read something like this, following the death of my spouse, I wasn't sure what to make of life, but with the care that came to me, I was restored to a new outlook on hope and life. And that person encouraged this congregation to continue to invest in that kind of work. That's one of the pieces of work our congregation does and does well. And so I invite our offerings to support just such work. So let our offerings be received.
from Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Then they arrived at the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons in him met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people came out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by the demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
morning, uh, Reverend Dow and Reverend Cliff were uh, with me in the office. I thought I had persuaded them to give me some help at uh, explaining this strange gospel story we had, but I see both of you are still sitting there, so I'm on my own, I think. Well, I, I don't care if you are uh, Joanna Wagstaff or Al Roker, uh, no one can honestly estimate the wrath of a storm. We can't control them or stop them. Uh, how does that psalm go? Though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam? Well, it seems that Jesus was having one of those days. When we find Jesus on the eastern shore, after crossing the waters of the Sea of Galilee, where, Jesus, uh, where Jews caught fish and Jesus caught disciples. But you know, this trip with his fearful disciples was not smooth sailing. Uh, you remember the story just before this, Jesus took a nap as they journeyed across the water and a storm blew up. And he took care of that storm by calming the waters. And come to find out that raging sea wasn't the only storm Jesus commanded that day. And so I want to explore with you what happens when Jesus lands on the east side, the Gentile side of the lake in that Gospel of Luke story that Greg just shared with us. So let's pray. O oh Lord, may I never lightly presume to speak your word, nor may we ever lightly pre presume to hear your word, <clears throat> for in your word is life. Amen. Now, his mother would have gazed in wonder as she nursed him a long time ago. He would have seemed Maybe as a little boy, he would have pleaded for mercy as his father's wrestling turned into a full-out tickling attack. I wonder if he ever had his first kiss or learned to fish. Did he ever have the chance to lie in a hushed field and count the stars at night? Where did they go wrong? Did someone hurt him? Uh, was he neglected? Uh, something must have happened. He was always a little off. Do you think he was married? I bet she left the kids, and who could blame her? How long has he been up there in the tombs? I don't know. Long enough for his clothes to have worn off, I suppose. I heard he broke free. Oh, no, I, I, I trust they'll find him and lock him up again. And naked as a jaybird, dirty as a pig, shameful, really crazy as a loon, whacked out of his mind as long as we can talk about his demons. We don't have to face ours, do we? Problem is, he's so gone. Yeah, we can no longer keep him under control. Even though we've gone to great lengths to keep him away from us, he's still causing problems, so we do what we have to do. We change the locks we turn him over to the officials, uh, we cut him out of our lives, chain him up, and pretend he just never existed. Is he a dead man walking or a living ghost? He dwells uh, in a tomb with chains and shackles and guards, yet no one can keep him restrained. Does he bruise himself because he is tormented, or does he bruise himself because he wants to feel something he can control? He's beyond saving. Demons. We all have demons. Of course, instead of addressing them head on, we go to great lengths to avoid them and silence them and control them. If all else fails, escape them. Voices, feelings, out of control, thoughts, habits, all those fragile parts of our hearts and our minds and our bodies we thought we had control over. We all have demons. Which is probably why Jesus made the trip to the spiritually unclean Roman-occupied Gentile town 
full of swine herders in the first place. Jesus had a point to make, I think. No one is so unclean we are out of God's reach. But we don't really want to hear it. As long as this dirty, crazy, homeless dude is out of sight, we can keep pretending as though we have our act together. Let's talk about him, shame him, blame him, try to fix him, control him, and then let's refuse to acknowledge he exists. Meanwhile, back on the home front, one glass takes the edge off, Another to unwind, a third for a little bit of numbing. Netflix, YouTube, a little smack. Doesn't it all basically work really the same? We all have demons. We can crawl into our beds and weep for days without explanations. Uncontrollable panic can attack us without warning. We lash out with angry outbursts. Fear or grief can, can lead us to the darkest tombs, sometimes it's impossible to escape or control these mighty storms. So we might try to control or escape other things instead. We might stop eating or we might eat too much. We may not have energy enough to move or we might exercise too much or work or shop way too much. We may play Xbox too much. And when all else fails, we resort to blaming our children or our partners or our parents. Nobody wants to face their own demons. But it seems this man, this man has nothing else to lose and nowhere to go. His demons are so powerful and all-consuming, all he can do is break free from the shackles, flee into the wilderness and hope he might outrun them. He was certainly strong enough to deal with chains. And he was used to being isolated too. But it's exceedingly tough to face demons alone. So this time he finds Jesus and he throws himself to the ground as if somewhere buried deep within his soul a faint whisper of hope remains. He is still there. Perhaps he was so broken, it was obvious that he had no power over these voices and no pride left to pretend otherwise. Even in this state of skepticism and desperation, probably because of it, the man proclaims Jesus as the Son of the Most High God. Let's remember that the ancient world the notion of many gods was normative. There was a bureaucracy of gods. Uh, that's just the way it was understood, the way the, the world worked, the way the universe was organized. This possessed guy realizes that in the bureaucracy of gods that exist, this Jesus in front of him is connected to the God at the top of the heap. The very top God, the most high God. How in the world would he even have known who Jesus was? I'm not sure he was expecting that much. It was as if he was testing, begging, smack-talking Jesus all at once. I wonder, what does it take for folks like you and, and me to drop to our knees and say, I'm here, son of the most high God. What are you going to do with the likes of me? Jesus' choice to annihilate the demons was not dependent on what this desperate man did or did not know in the midst of the crisis. This man didn't ask Jesus to save him. And there's a reformer and theologian, Karl Barth, who was quite clear that the disciples did not ask people whether they would accept Jesus or not. That instead, they told them of a reality, of a true freedom that was possible. Jesus just asked the man his name, but he responds with the names of his demons. Legion, they announce themselves with great vigor. We are 5,000 Roman soldiers attacking this man from the inside out. We are legion. There's no way 
There is no way that this man's mama named him Legion. It would be as if we stood beside a baptismal font with a precious baby and called him depression, or called her addiction or anorexia. Legion cannot be his name. God knows us and loves us for who God created us to be. This Gentile man would not have known God's promise through the prophet Isaiah, the one that says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. This man was an outsider, but Jesus is there on the eastern shoreline anyway. Dealing with this man and legion, society has it all wrong. Our human struggles and illnesses and weaknesses, they do not define us. After proclaiming Jesus as the son of the most high God, this man falls to his knees and names his demons. And if you've ever been to an AA or a, an NA or an Al-Anon meeting, you know what I'm talking about. Folks in recovery introduce themselves at meetings by sharing their God-given authentic name and then state their addiction. And right then, the demons begin losing their power. Where two or three are gathered, the demons know the gig is up. Now, I've mentioned Katrina in a sermon before. She's a young woman that I met years ago when she was about seven. She's now 30, 31. She wrestles with addiction. Cocaine and a smidgen of fentanyl is her current drug of choice. It's her demon. Katrina has bounced from valley to valley and is in the steepest dive I've ever seen for the past year and a bit. And as in the past, this dive began with a toxic boyfriend, but let's be honest, he's in it for the money because he tricks her out. And with her demon, she is foul-mouthed and crass when under the influence. And I'm pretty sure she was so high last week that she was unaware that she posted her advertisements for sex on her personal Facebook page, not her professional profile, complete with graphic photos. And you know, those that love her are wondering that she may be really lost this time forever. Some longtime supporters have abandoned her, and their comments on social media are not at all kind. They smack talk her. Her, her mother has written her off permanently, it seems. Her grandma manages to hang on to some hope. But it's ugly. The demons are ugly. But what I learned is that Legion does not do pretty. I don't know if Katrina can name her demon anymore. In the past, she's found the strength in community, but she is living so far out in the wilderness that I just don't know. I spoke to, to demons are there. I spoke with an official at the Memorial Library last week to change topics. I attended an awards ceremony because the library was being uh, honored by Reconciliation Canada uh, for the work that the library is doing in our community to foster reconciliation with our First Nations. It's a several year plan and I learned that the library embarked on this several year planned journey of reconciliation with some fear because they did not know how our community would respond. Was it ready to begin the work of reconciliation? The library feared not. But to its delight, they found members of the community more than eager and, and ready to engage in reconciliation work, to ask hard questions, and to have honest conversations to learn together. But there have been two exceptions to that good news. For the two excursions they have made into Christian congregations in our community, 
that's where they have experienced the pushback and the denial about past government policy and residential schools and the abuses that it all permitted. Ignorance is uh, a demon that can grab hold of us. And like an addiction, an illness, an abuse, ignorance will continue to have its way with us until we start naming it. And then we begin to unmask its power. When Jesus cast out demons, then we must step up and take responsibility, cast light on the dark shadows in the tombs together as community where two or three are gathered. Here's the thing. Yes, Jesus will meet us in our darkest tombs, but he comes with the promise that our lives will not stay the same. And that is good news for the naked demented guy. But perhaps we should consider what this means for us. You see, we don't mind sending a little food up the hill to the tombs. And we don't mind paying the soldiers to, to guard them. We'll even pay for new shackles when the old ones are shattered. But now, Jesus is, har is harnessing and demonstrating a power so threatening to our hierarchy and our need for control that we do not even stop to celebrate this man's restoration to wholeness. We are offended. We are angry. And did you notice the crowd's reaction in the story? Evidently, it cost more than anticipated. Are we sure this man's life is worth 600 pigs? After all, they weren't our demons. Someone owned those pigs. Someone raised those pigs. We were planning to feed our families and to make a tidy profit selling those pigs to the Roman army. And now they're drowned in the lake. Who's going to compensate for economic impact of our loss? Are we expected to pay for his sin? Are we required to cover the cost of his reconciliation, his restoration? We live on the west side of the lake. We know about the promise Isaiah was talking about, that God calls us and knows us by name. We were in the boat when Jesus calmed the storm. We witnessed Jesus turning out bread enough to feed 5,000. We shouted, Hosanna, and we cried out, crucify him, and we wept, and we peered into an empty tomb. And we know the living Christ. And if we, the church, dare confess Jesus Christ, then you tell me, what are we to do with the man in the tombs? I wish I knew his name. And the crowd, they beg Jesus to leave, get out of town. And the restored man pleads to go with them. I think he knew how difficult that town would be on. But no, he's instructed to stay and share his story of redemption. And I imagine he probably had some healing work to do with his own loved ones, if he could still find them. The restored man has some good news to share in a community of unbelievers. In Christ, and strengthened by the Spirit, we find courage to face our demons together. And by his grace, we're called by his name and set free. We're called to cross the sea to the east side, to address the demons of those who have not had access to such power or knowledge of such expansive love. For there is nothing you can do, nowhere you can go, no dark tomb, tomb dark enough, no sin to ugly and dirty and no demon too powerful to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High God, have mercy on us. Set us free from all the forces that seem so attractive to us at times, the forces that can take hold of us. 
We praise you that you are Lord over the wind and the waves, over tyrants and unjust communities. Thank you for promising the day when all might enjoy the fullness of life in you. Give us grace to be faithful to the call that you've placed upon us to return to our homes and tell the story of what you have done for even the likes of us. wherever you go this summer, whether you're off having fun with your visiting family and friends, whether you're quietly at home, wherever you go, may you recognize the face of Christ in the people you meet. And may the people you meet along the way recognize the face of Christ in all of you. 